This little talk is about second chances. Not that anything that happens to us is really by chance. I am Chris Swafield and I'm one of the elders here at Whitehorse Baptist Church. I asked Jesus to save me in the fall of 1964 and he did. This was my first second chance. A senior retired school teacher was going door to door in Winnipeg, inviting parents to send their children to Sunday school. So my late wife and I went to Portage Avenue Baptist Church with our first two children. We were then invited, there's that word again, to stay for church. On our second visit, I felt something on my shoulder. It was a Bible. My first pastor said, you'll be needing this. He came every Thursday night and answered our questions with scripture. His favorite expression was, what saith the word of the Lord? When I have questions now, I look in my Thompson Chain Study Bible for answers, a chain of verses. Jeremy asked me to talk about my other second chance. My first wife passed away in 2005 with brain cancer. I was pretty fragile and lonely. I went online to eHarmony. After some unsuitable referrals, I met Sandy online. We established who we were spiritually and then began phone calls and emails. I came to Whitehorse for two weeks later that year and stayed with Dan and Marie. Within three days, I knew I wanted to marry Sandy. Along with Sandy came her young at heart, 82 year old mother. Such a joy to love your future mother-in-law as well as your future wife. Sandy and I firmly believe that we have been blessed by God and that he brought us together. Our marriage has proven that God gives not only second chances, but golden opportunities. Thank you. morning everyone. Uh, hopefully by this time I'm headed back to Whitehorse uh, with a moose in the back of my truck and uh, that would be really good. But um, thank you so much to Josh for recording this so that I could go away hunting and uh, it's kind of a new thing for me and maybe it's a new thing for you, to y for you as well. So we're just going to kind of roll through this. Uh, we're working through a, a, a series titled Every Season of Life. And a couple weeks ago, we looked at retirement. Last week, we looked at uh, what it meant to be widowed, both in biblical culture and today's culture. Well, today we're kind of taking one step further, as Chris already introduced, and uh, we're looking at second chances at marriage, and specifically, uh, you know, what it's like to become a newlywed again. And so, if, uh, if you, <clears throat> a little bit of a caveat, I guess, uh, we're not going to focus on divorce and remarriage. We're going to specifically uh, work on being widowed and then r being remarried after being widowed. Um, we kind of, earlier on in the series, we, we kind of unpacked divorce and remarriage. And if you missed that, that's okay. You can go to our website, whbc.ca, and you can get listen online there. Or you can maybe go to iTunes and download our podcast or go to YouTube and watch the video there, the sermons. And you can still catch all that content. It's not gone. You can catch up on that divorce and remarriage. Today, we're going to look at what happens after you're widowed and uh, all of a sudden you meet someone again and you fall in love again and you have the opportunity to get, to get remarried. So... All right, for our key text today, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 7. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, we've, we've looked at it a few times throughout this series. It's, a, it's an awesome chapter in regards to relationships as a whole, but specifically romantic relationships. When we were talking early on in the series with dating, singleness, uh, newlyweds, the first time, and, and all that stuff, we really looked at this passage, and we're going to look at it again now that we're talking about newlyweds 2.0. And specif specifically, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7, scroll down to verse 39. 1 Corinthians 7, 39. Let's read that together. 
A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. Uh, to get a bit uh, different context, I'm also going to read the ESV or the English Standard Version. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Okay, so that seems pretty straightforward that a widow or widower, in our, in our case, we're talking about either, could get remarried if they want. But that's one passage uh, in biblical study. Let's, let's look at another one. So we're going we're gonna to stop there, keep a, keep a thumb or a finger or a bookmark in 1 Corinthians. And now we're going to turn over a little earlier in the New Testament to Romans, to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And we're not going to scroll too far, just to verse 2. Romans 7, verse 2. Here Paul talks specifically, uh, well, he's talking to the Roman church, but he, he references more of the legal side of remarriage. And he talks a bit about the law. Verse 2. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he li- is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law she is released from the law of marriage. Okay? And in the ESV, again, to get a different, different context, different translation, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Clear. Scripture is clear. We, we're we're kind of dealing with the whether we can or can't. Biblically, Absolutely, without a doubt, it is clear uh, both to the Corinthian church and to the Roman church, Paul is clear that remarriage is totally an option. If, if, if there's a widow or a widower who wants a second chance at falling in love and uh, finding that companionship of marriage, it's allowed. It's totally good. And if we're to take a moment, if we're to kind of go back in time as we do sometimes and we go back to first century culture, if we're to try and bring our minds back there to what it must have been like to be widowed in in that time, we did it a little bit last week, we kind of went there. Let's go back there again and try to think about this. Think about who Paul is writing to, who God is leading Paul to write to here. And it's fascinating because for a widow or a widower, male or female, who's lost their spouse, for both of them, there must be a deep desire to feel love and companionship again. That's understandable. That's a given on both. But let's remember what we learned last week, that that this is kind of a patriarchal, male-dominated society. And so for a moment, let's think of a male widow, a widower. When he loses his wife, okay, in that time, at that time period, men didn't really clean or cook or care for the home. And maybe women are thinking they still don't. Um, sorry about that. Sorry to my wife. I don't maybe do that enough either. But either way, first century, uh, first century church, first century culture, that didn't happen. So try to, try to imagine that, that the home, a house was made a home by the wife, by the woman. This is what happened in this culture. After a widow passed away, the widower would come home and that house would feel cold and it wouldn't feel like a home. It would be very difficult. Um, and it's, it is probably difficult now in, in a lot of families and a lot of situations. But we can almost guarantee that the widower wouldn't have really known how to care for the home, clean, cook especially. It would have been a difficult one. He wouldn't have been trained to do that it, Now let's move to the widow, to a woman who's lost her husband. We talked about this last week. As soon as their husband passes away, it's survival mode. It is survival mode because the men are the ones, they're the breadwinners, they're, they're the financial support. So all of a sudden, her needs to feed herself and clothe herself, incredibly difficult. And so there's going to be a desire in first century culture, there's going to be a desire to get remarried for love and companionship. But for a man, there's going to be a a desire to get remarried 
to make his house a home again. And for a woman, there's going to be a desire to get remarried, perhaps even just for survival. So we need to understand that, that when we take that, when we, when we look at that view of remarriage after being widowed, we look at the scripture and we understand that, we can see why even biblically it's almost encouraged. It's almost, if you have that desire, do it, go ahead. But what about our culture? How do we look at it? We can't assume anything. We can't assume that someone fully knows how to care for a home. We can't assume that for anyone. We can't, can't assume in our culture that someone is fully financially taken care of. About the only thing that we can assume that's the exact same as biblical time is that the people that felt lost in loneliness and desire love and companionship in the Bible today still feel lost in loneliness and still desire love and companionship. That, that is the connection of both worlds. And that will continue to go on. That when someone has lost their spouse, a second chance to fall in love is a wonderful thing. Second chance at love and companionship. There's a but though. There's a stipulation when we look at our text. When we get back into 1 Corinthians 7 and we look at 39, it it says she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But, there's a but. He must belong to the Lord. He must belong to the Lord. And and it's crazy because this, this statement in our series, Every Season of Life, this kind of brings us back. This brings us all the way back to when we're talking about dating. He must belong to the Lord. She must belong to the Lord. And, and, and this, is, this is the thing that, that we started we, when we talked about dating and singleness and what that means to start, you know, getting into the dating relationship, courting, engagement, the, the newlywed experience, this whole thing. There's one question that we focused on, and it was, do they love Jesus more than they love me? And do I love Jesus more than I love them? Paul's asking that same kind of question in a different way. Do they belong to the Lord? Do they belong to the Lord? That's the stipulation. You can marry whoever you want. Go for it. If if your husband or wife has passed away, get remarried. Go for it. It It is by law. You're right. You can do that. But they have to belong to the Lord. They have to belong to Jesus. Paul wrote a second letter to the church of Corinthians. And in the second letter to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, look at, um, look at chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and look at 14 to 16, verses 14 to 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We read this when we were talking about dating, and here we are again, we're talking about second chances at marriage, and we're right back to this text. We're talking about it again. Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. That's awesome. We're talking about it again. We're talking about it again. We've worked through all these seasons of life and here we are, we're nearing the end. Next week, we're gonna be talking about heaven, our eternal season, when we pass from this earth. Here we are at the end and we're still talking about this passage. It's coming back up. Relationships have got to focus on Jesus first. Do we belong to the Lord first? Every relationship, especially romantic ones, they've got to be centered around Jesus first. Last week, we, we saw a video, and it was kind of a sad video because it, it was about a widow, uh, a sweet old lady, who was taken in a scam by a con artist. And 
he, uh, they called it the lonely heart scam is what the news reports named it. And this woman had a lonely heart. She was experiencing loss and loneliness and she wanted to fall in love again. She wanted a second chance at love and companionship. And she talked for hours with this, with this man and, and he figured out that she was a believer, that she had a deep faith in the Lord and he used that. And on the, on the video, they showed these, these you know, <laughs> little clips of their emails and, and he, he tried to imitate a person who loved God, who had a relationship with God in order to get her money and to con her. And so how do we support second chance marriages? How do we support second ma- marriages for families, friends that are seeing a second relationship take place and there's, there's a bit of anxiety, there's worry because you love that person. You don't want them to get hurt. You definitely don't want them to be conned. And, and so as a church family or as friends and family, we kind of look at that and h- how do we navigate that? Well, I think it's important to encourage our friend or family member who, who might be starting to date someone and, and maybe falling in love again, you, you go back to a few key questions. You know, first, w- what evidence do I see or hear from their first marriage that they love Jesus, that they were passionate about Jesus? What, what evidence do I see about Jesus? <laughs> you know, do I see and hear uh, about their their widowed life, about their single life after their spouse passed? Do I see any evidence of Jesus there? And then the tough one, in our relationship now, as you start to date that person, you got to really look at it and say, okay, am I experiencing a closeness to Jesus with this person? Does this person bring me closer to Jesus or does, does he steal my devotion from Jesus or does she steal my devotion from Jesus? Because a marriage, a real true marriage as it's forming, as a couple uh, that individually is passionate about Jesus grows even more passionately about Jesus the closer they come together. And, and if there's a widow or a widower who's drawing further away from Jesus because of a person, it's a key sign. There's something wrong. There's something off. But maybe you're thinking, Jeremy, you're just being harsh. You know, what's the big deal? It's, it's their second chance at marriage. Let them be happy. Don't, don't say anything. Don't rebuke. Don't, don't get in the way. Don't make things difficult. Let them have their second chance and just be happy. And that can come, you know, you maybe think, especially if they're, if they're very old, maybe they've only got a few years left on this earth and, and you want to kind of ignore those details. They, you know, they found someone who cares whether or not they believe in Jesus, just let them be. And that's easier. That's the easier road. But we're, we're missing, we're missing the bigger second chance. And Chris mentioned that in his video too. Because marriage is just a picture of the greatest second chance that humanity gets. God created a plan, a new covenant, where he would send his, send his perfect son to die for all the evil, wrong things that we did. And he died on a cross, and three days later he rose again, conquered sin and death, and he's ascended to heaven to prepare a place for us. And those of us who believe that and have chosen to follow him, we are brought into something called the church. And scripture tells us that this church is his bride. Turn with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation is the last book in your Bible. Here at the very end. Chapter 19. And there's one amazing verse, a beautiful verse, verse 7. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb, that's Jesus, the Lamb, the perfect Lamb that was sacrificed. The wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride, that's us, that's you, that's me, The church, his bride, has made herself ready. See, there's a a wedding feast that's going to take place. There's a marriage. The biggest marriage in the universe is going to take place at the end of this world. 
And, and for those of us that believe in Jesus, we're gonna be called as his bride and we're gonna live in holy matrimony. We're gonna live in perfection in his kingdom that he's prepared for us. And we will live in eternity with the lamb that was sacrificed for us. Because we're not a perfect bride. We're in a completely imperfect bride. We got baggage beyond baggage. But he doesn't see that. He wipes that clean. And we're dressed in white, even though we don't deserve it. And, and so when, when we ask ourselves, when we ask ourselves, when we see a Christian or a believer starting to fall in love with an unbeliever and, and we think, okay, well, you know, they've been so unhappy, they're so lonely, I shouldn't step in, I, I shouldn't bother them. Be careful, because what we're saying is that this earthly representation of this eternal covenant isn't worth it. And because every single earthly relationship that's founded on Jesus, that's founded the right way, that's founded on this book, every earthly relationship is an opportunity to share the greater story of the greater covenant marriage of Jesus Christ and his church. And when we look at the marriage covenant like a sham, like it's just something to, to make us happy while we're on earth so we can just live a happy life and go on it, we're missing it. Because our earthly marriages, if we can work on them so hard and understand that they are an opportunity to share the gospel, every Christian couple that is committed through thick and thin till death do us part, literally till death do us part, every time we do that, we are a earthly representation of the gospel, the covenant of Jesus in his church. And so it doesn't matter if it's our first marriage, our second marriage. It doesn't matter if it's our seventh marriage. When, when Paul writes, when God leads Paul to write, they can marry anyone they want, but they must belong to the Lord. Paul's not just saying this so that he can govern over people. He's saying it because he knows he has seen the picture of the new covenant of the lamb and his bride. And if we can keep that in focus, we will make sure that whether it's first, second, seventh marriage, it doesn't matter. We will make sure that our friends and family that know Jesus, we, we will be bold enough to have the conversation with them. Make sure they love Jesus more than you. Make sure they love Jesus more than you. Before you fall in love, before you get head over heels, make sure they love Jesus more than you. And even more importantly, we may have to rebuke our friends and family and say, make sure you love Jesus more than him. Make sure you love Jesus more than her. It's gonna go south. As we conclude here, we're gonna have a time of, uh, time of response. Maybe the Lord's met you in some way here. I know he's definitely met me as I studied this, this passage over again, just bringing all this stuff, just this wave of this whole series just came over me again as I prepared. It was pretty amazing. Um, the Lord does amazing things with preaching series. He brings back themes that you didn't think you were going to see at the start. It's awesome. But as we respond, there's, there's an opportunity for us to just sit and reflect. We can do that. There's an opportunity for us to sing. We can do that. We can pray. Uh, one of the elders will be up front come forward, you know, have, ask them. If you're, maybe there's someone you know that isn't in a good relationship. You just want prayer for that. That's fine. Tell them. Maybe you're in a relationship and you need prayer to strength to get out of that relationship because it's going bad. Do it. They'll pray for that. Maybe it's some illness or some other need. The elders are awesome at just, at just praying for our, for our people. Uh, that's what they're there for. That's what I'm there for when I'm here, <laughs> you know. But also there's an opportunity to give in response to worship and you can give, the ushers will come forward at this time and, uh, or uh, you can give online if, if that's your thing through your smartphone or whatever. It, it's, it's all worship, it's all giving to the Lord however you do it. The method doesn't matter. It's the message we're sending to the Lord that we're committed to him. Um, I'll see you back here next week for our last message of the series, Heaven, Our Eternal Season. It's going to be super awesome. It'll be great. And then the following week is Commitment Sunday, October 2nd, I believe. And for those of you that maybe are thinking about baptism, 
we could make that happen. October 2nd, we're going to baptize some people, hopefully. For those of you that are thinking about membership, talk to the elders today and uh, let them know that you want to become a member of our church. You want to take that next step of commitment. Maybe you want to volunteer for a ministry team. We, we had the ministry leaders up here last week, and uh, they gave their pitches, and they need help. Maybe you want to join that team. Maybe you want to lead a ministry. There's a few ministries uh, out there that, that are still in need. You know, um, and, uh, and maybe there's a, a family commitment going on for you. Maybe you've had a child, and maybe your child's even a little bit older. Maybe it's not newborn or anything like that. But you've never dedicated that child to the Lord, said publicly here before this body that, that, that you want this body to help parent that child, help you, and you just want to commit them to the Lord. We're going to do that as well on October 2nd. So lots of awesome stuff on Commitment Sunday. The next two weeks are going to be really cool. All right. Thanks so much uh, for listening to this video sermon, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.